hello everyone uh, welcome to marantis labs tech, talk, uh, tech talks uh, we are here uh, where we dive deep into cloud native topics use cases tutorials and many more to educate you all uh, i am avinash desiredi a senior solutions architect and developer advocate here at like marantis uh, i'll be your host as well as speaker today uh, we encourage our questions like so much. So if you have like any questions, like put them in the chat and we'll get through them uh, uh, throughout the session. With that, uh, here is what we are going to, uh, we'll be going through in this talk today. We'll just like get a basic understanding of like what is Kubernetes and what are, what is an application and then uh, why do we need to containerize it and look further into like the Kubernetes features, the architecture, followed by the core primitives. Like there are like multiple Kubernetes objects uh, uh, that uh, there are different types of Kubernetes objects uh, that are supported, but we'll be looking at only very few to get us started. And once we get familiar uh, in the future sessions, we will be going into uh, much more advanced topics. And uh, so this is uh, not just like a talk session, like we have like a like a detailed demo where I'll be uh, sh showcasing uh, a snippet of code, and I will be containerizing the uh, code, uh, and then we'll be running the uh, running the application uh, in two different clusters, like the lens uh, dev cluster as well as uh, uh, the uh, Mirandus Kubernetes engine cluster what we are like trying to showcase here is like once you package your application it's easy to move around and run in any different uh, in multiple environments then uh, we have like q and a at the end and i will be like taking uh, i'll be like going through like some q and a's in between the session as well okay with that uh, let's start with an official definition of like kubernetes uh, Kubernetes is a, like a portable, extensible open source uh, platform for managing containerized workloads and services that facilitates like both declarative configuration and automation. It has like large, rapidly growing ecosystem. Like Kubernetes services like supports like tools like that are widely available. Uh, it is initially like developed by Google uh, like using GoLang uh, based on their experiences. Uh, it is like 100% open source. And uh, now it is part of uh, CNCF. CNCF stands for like Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, it is a part of like Linux Foundation. It is a project in Linux Foundation, which founded in 2015 to help uh, advance like container technologies and align the tech industry around the evolution of containers. So, uh, like the formal definition like so i've like referred to as like containerized uh, workloads and like the container uh, and then kubernetes uh, is also uh, like uh, referred to as the like container orchestrator and the responsibilities of container orchestrator uh, are there are like several responsibilities of container orchestrator but uh, uh, for simplicity what it does in simple is it runs and manages containers in multiple in a kubernetes cluster uh, Kubernetes can uh, run on uh, any cloud environment or it can be a bare metal and it has like a rich ecosystem uh, for plugins, uh, for scheduling, like storage, networking, etc. Uh, so I know like all these like terms like seems complex, but like I, I, I usually relate this like the concept of Kubernetes to an airport ecosystem. We are all like familiar with how an airport operates, like at least like at a very high level. So if we look at like an airport, uh, an airport can be at different locations. Like it can be uh, in uh, London, like in uh, Bangalore, like Dallas, or uh, uh, like the, the concept of airport, like how it operates, the core foundational piece is a uh, same anywhere. And uh, there are like different types of airports. So uh, we can uh, say like uh, an airport just for like a, mil like a military base, like. Uh, with their airport and then there is an airport like facility which just uh, uh, manages uh, the cargo cargo airplanes so similarly kubernetes is a platform or like or like a, it's like it's like a framework which can be fit into which can be, which is portable that means it can run in, either in cloud or it can run in um, uh, on prem 
or it can run uh, on bare metal uh, on a physical server or it can run in a raspberry pi uh, module so that's that, that, that's uh, that's how like uh, we can relate it to like the real uh, world uh, scenario and if you look at within an airport uh, there are like different types of restaurants like there are different uh, uh, you know different types of airlines who are uh, serving uh, who are like managing the facilities around uh, around a plane and uh, so all those like like the restaurants can change like from time to time like like there is a wide range of like restaurants that can be in there or a wide range of uh, the carriers similarly the kubernetes platform is extensible that means we can there are uh, that means like the storage options like for our applications can be plugged in as needed. The networking options with the Kubernetes can be plugged in as needed. Kubernetes has this uh, is a very it became very powerful with its uh, extensible framework because anything that we can think of like support for uh, like a cloud based or a solution or a different or a networking solution based on the need, it can be uh, adapted or. If, or the extensible framework helps us to like create and then fill in that gap. With that, uh, let's look into. Uh, so we know we uh, we now know about like Kubernetes, like in general, like what uh, what it does. But where does uh, it fit in? Like, and also I refer to like containerized workloads or uh, or managed containers. What exactly is a container? How exactly an application and container are related? So here uh, in in the diagram that we have, like a static website, like an application can be a static website, uh, like a front end or a back end API engine or an analytic DB. And what we usually want to do is like an application will be developed on our local desktop and it will be like tested in the QA and then it can and then it can be uh, it, it is usually like run on different devices or like different environments. So one of the challenge that uh, th that we all used to have like with before containers is uh, like an application consists of like the application like functionality, which is uh, in its code base and the libraries that it uses and all the libraries in the form of dependencies and then the application runtime it runtime itself. So packaging all these three code modules uh, and then taking them to different environments is challenging. So just breaking down uh, even further, like, let's say if you have a, a web application, in order to run the uh, web application, we need a web server uh, that it should be on. And once we put, uh, and we need to ensure our local desktop, like the task or queue environment, like the production cluster, every uh, at every uh, on every environment we need to configure the uh, nginx web server only then we can deploy our uh, our website on top of it let's say if we uh, up, upgrade 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 uh, the nginx website on our local desktop then uh, we need to upgrade the engine on, on every uh, sorry uh, the nginx uh, on uh, web server on desktop it needs to be upgraded on every environment wherever we wherever it is run so it it creates a, a complexity or like a, the dependency uh, that is involved between like multiple environments like be, between the code and then the infrastructure leads to complexity in managing that and how it is uh, uh, eliminated or like how it is eliminated is with the help of containers it it abstracts the application like from the underlying infrastructure where uh, all the application dependency like the application code the dependencies and the runtime are packaged together uh, into a container and uh, the container uh, is um, can, can be uh, the container can then be run on any 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 uh, environment it can be like local desktop or like the qa or like production environment, you move it to cloud. So we package the application in the form of container. And like, let's say if you have to upgrade our application like to a latest version, 
we swapped the container with the newer version of the uh, container. And uh, uh, like the formal definition, like or like the formal uh, like way of looking at it is like it's like a standard unit of software, like that packages up code and all its dependencies. So the application run can run quickly and rapidly from uh, one computing environment to another. And uh, uh, coming like from like, like like knowing like a little bit more about the history, you can think about okay, I, I we can do this in VMs as well. Like uh, I have like a VM, but uh, uh, and I can uh, like take a quick snapshot of it and then move it into a different uh, environment, like a different place. That's like a quick thing that. Uh, uh, that that comes into mind, but the where the benefits are, uh, where we get like the benefits are like how how can we differentiate like even like, with relevant with in relates to uh, virtual machines is uh, in virtual machines uh, or uh, like going a little back into uh, into the history like when. Uh, we have like these uh, like huge uh, like the servers like the bare metal servers and on top of it uh, we used to like run applications and the one of the key challenge uh, with that is the resource utilization because let's say if the server goes uh, let's say if the server uh, uh, so th there are like more chances uh, because like the application is not serving uh, like the internet number of users the server is underutilized and the servers are like tied with like only single operating system uh, like uh, like linux or windows that means uh, it is restricted to use only like specific sort of uh, uh, operating system and then only specific sort of applications can be deployed on the server so fast forward like we need to find or we need a way to manage the resources efficiently on the hardware uh, so the so the challenge is addressed with the uh, introduction of uh, virtualization technology and uh, where on top of server uh, like there is a hypervisor layer that is uh, that is uh, introduced uh, inter introduced and all, what hypervisor does is it allows us to create much multiple guest operating systems uh, so multiple all these multiple guest operating systems can share uh, the single hardware like it can uh, it can utilize the hardware resources effectively now from here uh, like we have like manage like like the uh, 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 the operating system like it's not portable like if you have to like uh, like uh, take a snapshot of the operating system and then like move it into a different machine or like let's say if you want to bring up a new operating system like for a specific application needs the amount of time that it takes is a uh, huge so uh, that's uh, and then the operating system like let's say if you have like two guest operating systems there are like several common layers like uh, in the form of like kernel and then like uh, under, uh, the low level libraries which are uh, available at every uh, on every uh, operating system so that's where uh, the containers are inter introduced uh, mainly like to reduce remove the developer friction developer and operator friction from the previous scenario like that we have looked at here like with the complex metrics that we have and that's like the first piece and then the next one is like mainly from the operational uh, uh, mainly like creating the high portable environment like easy to migrate to any cloud or like hybrid environments like so we can move our application to different environments and once the like as these applications are isolated like they are more secured uh, in a container environment and they are like lightweight so which allows us to uh, run multiple applications like on uh, like the same operating system and also uh, uh, reduces uh, re reduces server and the licensing cost and uh, and also we can scale them scale up and scale down at a rapid pace compared to what we can do uh, on a vm so with, with the background on uh, the uh, on the containers uh, so kubernetes is a container orchestrator so it uh, 
what it does is uh, it uh, manages the containers on multiple nodes uh, on, on multiple nodes or on, on our infrastructure in addition to just like running uh, running a container uh, it it, ha it provides like some additional features like it has it is like very feature rich and here are like some few uh, uh, key features so whenever we have our applications on vm if we have to load balance our uh, user request, then we need to uh, create a load balancer which has to be managed uh, uh, for individual applications that are running on specific ports uh, manually. But Kubernetes has this inbuilt like service discovery and load balancing feature where the containers uh, are uh, containers which have like their own IP address. Uh, IP address, like let's say if there is like high traffic on a container, the Kubernetes, uh, uh, the components in Kubernetes, or like it allows, uh, it allows the user request to load balance and distribute like the network traffic, so the deployments are stable, uh, and all the requests are like not going to like single one. The next one is like the storage orchestration, where uh, Kubernetes allows you to like automatically mount storage system from of your choice like it can be a local file system or it can be a cloud provider like file system or uh, like it can be like a nas uh, storage so it ha it can uh, it provides the um, flexibility uh, in terms of uh, what the application needs and it has uh, the automated like rollouts and uh, rollbacks capability that means let's say if uh, our application uh, let's say uh, if we want to scale our application to a certain state then kubernetes uh, will automatically ensure the application is all uh, the application always has uh, x number of replicas by scaling up or like maintaining the desired state of uh, the application and uh, the uh, uh, automatic bin packing like refers to like it provides like the cluster uh, uh, you provide like the Kubernetes cluster with uh, a set of nodes that it can run containerized tasks. You tell Kubernetes like how much resources, uh, how much of CPU and memory uh, each container needs, and Kubernetes can fit all the containers like into nodes. So it 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 manages the scheduling uh, automatically and makes sure, uh, or it, it it finds the respective nodes. Uh, which can fit in these application containers and uh, allocates accordingly. Uh, it has like the self healing capabilities. Uh, where if when we have the uh, a large scale infrastructure, the nodes, the applications, they are expected to fail. Like the Kubernetes ecosystem, like it is like designed with uh, the concept of like with with uh, with the thought process of anything can fail in our infrastructure. So it has built-in self-healing capabilities. Let's say if a, a node goes down, the app, like all the applications in the form of containers that are running in that node are moved into a different uh, uh, node or that means like are rescheduled. So the application itself is, is like self-healing by moving into a different node or it can be an application within the same uh, node, like it fails uh, because uh, a user-defined process, uh, you know, a process killed the specific container. So it, Kubernetes has capability of identifying that okay something is wrong with the application, and it kind of self heals. Uh, and in addition to that, like uh, it has like secret and configuration management, uh, which lets you to store and manage like sensitive information like such as passwords, like RSH keys, etc and we can like uh, update uh, these secrets uh, uh, when needed so uh, with uh, the background uh, on uh, these features let's uh, dive into dive into the architecture of kubernetes now uh, it uh, follows the master worker uh, architecture where uh, master node like uh, uh, takes the uh, master node like ma master node manages different worker nodes in the cluster 
and uh, how well the workload needs to be scheduled is managed by uh, the master node it consists of like api server uh, api server like contains like various methods uh, like to directly access kubernetes uh, and it is api server is the gateway so whenever we are communicating with a kubernetes cluster uh, that means we are talking to the api server component within uh, the kubernetes master node and it intercepts our uh, the user request so typically like when we try to uh, when we Whenever we want to deploy an application or want to look at a status of an application, we will be uh, accessing uh, the API server, like either using a user interface, like it can be a graphical interface or like a command line. kubectl is a command line utility to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. So when uh, we are interacting with, with the cluster, we'll be like directly talking to the API server. And once the application uh, configuration is received uh, by the API server, then it interacts internally with different components uh, to schedule like the workload. So the scheduler, uh, like as the name suggests, like it assigns uh, uh, assigns the work to different nodes in the cluster, and the controller manager is responsible to for keep to keep track of worker nodes like if they are healthy or not uh, if uh, if uh, you know, they provide like provide an endpoint access like to the application like to the outside world like if uh, there is any uh, um, any container uh, e failed it it going it's going controller man said controller manager is going to uh, ensure uh, you know it tracks of like the status of the cluster and then uh, and then controls like communication between parts and like different mechanisms in there. And we have uh, etc uh, etcd. Uh, it works as like a backend so a backend for service discovery uh, that uh, stores the cluster state and its configuration. Everything is like persisted in uh, etcd database. And the next on the right, like we have a, a worker node. A worker node consists of like the container runtime. Uh, and that uh, that is responsible for like pulling the images from the registry and then uh, and then running the content running the actual container in its runtime environment and the kubelet uh, it, it it actually like uh, so this is one of the key uh, uh, service in the uh, worker node or like in any node in the kubernetes cluster where uh, kubelet talks to the api server and manages containers on it on its node kubelet is like the primary uh, like service that receives instructions like from uh, different uh, services from the master node and the kube proxy uh, e like load balances like the network traffic like between the application components and the uh, and the outside world let's say if worker node one has to uh, Yeah, it, it manages uh, like the traffic uh, between uh, application components like and the outside world. Okay, uh, with that, uh, uh, let's look at uh, some you know, core primitives. Like we were like talking about uh, like the architecture, but and then we spoke about like the container. So our application is usually like bundled in a container, but can Kubernetes like run this container directly? No, Kubernetes has uh, the basic atomic unit of or the deployable unit in Kubernetes is pod. A pod consists of like one or more co-located containers like that share like the volume space and uh, are like part of a single context. So when we build a container, like from our application code, let's say like front end and uh, front end, like we have like two components. One is the API component like that. Um, and then one is like the graphical interface component. So they, so those two functionalities are like developed separately and then bundled in it two different containers. We can either like run, merge them in, in a put them in a single pod or they can the containers can be split uh, in different pods but a pod is like the basic deployable unit 
uh, that uh, Kubernetes schedules it on on the cluster. Okay, and uh, on the right, like so, here is how like a simple pod specification looks like. So uh, all the Kubernetes APIs, like uh, like we are like talking like to uh, So we are like talking to like this API server, similar to like how an application code is versioned, like version A, version B. The specification of these objects are versioned in the Kubernetes environment, and that is referred to as a API version. Uh, and then the kind, so which is like the type of object that we wanted to create, is uh, referred to as a pod here. And uh, the metadata. Are, refers to let's say if the uh, if the kind changes like from uh, pod to the deployment then uh, we are seeing like in uh, the, the api version uh, might might differ because in this specific v1 api version we need to have the kind of object that it is using and we have the metadata section where uh, uh, like all the metadata attributes like name, where it should reside, etc., everything uh, is is part of the metadata, and then the actual specification of the pod is in the spec uh, is defined under spec where we have where it is where we have containers. In this example, refers to an nginx container, so it, it is using uh, nginx image, and then it is exposed on port eighty. Now uh, we have a pod, uh, but a pod's state needs to be managed. So this is where like, the controller manager comes into picture. Uh, the replica set, the, the deployment are uh, uh, are managed by the controller manager, where replica set is like a process, like that runs like multiple instances of a pod and keeps the specified number of pods constant. So let's say if pod, one of the pod goes down, the replica set ensures that uh, it, it it does not have the desired state and it is going to recreate this particular pod. And uh, the deployment uh, is used to tell like Kubernetes like how to create and modify instances. Uh, that means uh, like uh, like it create like deployment creates like sort of like a templatized version of uh, our pod specification. Uh, deployment like can scale like the number of replica pods and, and enables like a rollout of updated code uh, in the controller manager. Let's say if we uh, upgrade our application like to a new image, it creates an internally like new replica set and uh, like deployment uh, the deployment object contro uh, controller will uh, uh, ensures the new replica set is uh, healthy up and running and that's when it will it is going to remove the old replica set so it's like a templatized uh, it's like a templatized version of like to manage the uh, state of the application uh, with all its like multiple instances and similarly uh, if you are like if, like the example here like showcases the deployment belongs to a different api version so that's why we have we are seeing apps slash v1 and uh, we have like a simple metadata and then the specification. Um, so like, uh, as I mentioned, like the, uh, the, the pod, the, so deployment is like a templatized version of like the pod and replica set. So the template here like refers to the pod specification. Everything that we have seen in the pod specification, it is uh, in here. And uh, it is mapped to the deployment object using the labels. Okay, now uh, like we have seen, like we have a deployment uh, which manages uh, the replica set, which in turn manages the pods. Now we have the pods, but how can they be accessed? Because pod has uh, uh, pods are assigned with an IP address, but a pod like the core uh, construct is like a pod can fail at any point of time. So how do we uh, ensure that uh, the new pod that gets created uh, can be accessed? So we cannot access these pods directly using the IP address. So that's where like uh, there is uh, uh, the pods are grouped into uh, objects like different uh, objects to maintain like a stable like uh, 
immortal uh, state for uh, state for uh, a user who is accessing. So it, it's like unified method of accessing uh, to expo uh, accessing the exposed workloads of uh, workloads of part. Uh, there are like four types of services in here. Like there's a cluster IP, like there's a node port, uh, like load balancer and external IP. These are like the different ways, ways of exposing the pod into a pod. For example, uh, like uh, like node port is, is um, exposes the application pod uh, on a specific port number. And then we, like the load balancer will automatically create a load balancer uh, in front of all these pods. So whenever uh, like a pod fails, the load balancer configurations are updated uh, accordingly to uh, uh, to route the traffic to the available pods and then the newly created pod. So the specification that like we see it like similar to what we have seen before, and uh, but the specification section changes where it has type port but the metadata kind and API version remains the same. Okay, now uh, with that, um, uh, we are we are going to uh, 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 look into a demo where we'll like deploy a sample application uh, with like three replicas uh, using uh, the deployment configurations, and we'll create a service and uh, try to access the application. Okay, so uh, I have uh, the uh, uh, like my demo environment is running on AWS where I have provisioned the nodes, load balancer, and then created like a few DNS entries to access our application. And uh, the cluster uh, that is running in AWS is using Monadis Kubernetes engine, uh, which uh, which provides like enterprise uh, Monadis Kubernetes engine provides like enterprises with the easiest and fastest way to deploy uh, cloud native applications and uh, we are going to use the lens to uh, uh, to access the Monadis kubernetes engine and also lens has the uh, uh, a feature called like dev cluster uh, where uh, a cl uh, where like these clusters like are personal and optimized like for software uh, like development needs instead of uh, uh, instead of having uh, uh, having a machine with a huge amount of resources, uh, with large amount of resources locally, and then constantly battling like to uh, like run out of resources by closing different applications. So uh, like Lens uh, uh, is uh, Lens provides this uh, inbuilt application that we are going to look at like to access the cluster. And the code base is uh, available here, and I'm gonna quickly. Uh, I'm going to quickly like put this code base in the chat so you can refer to the code directly. So let me drop in the chat. Okay, before we jump into a demo, let me take like few questions. So uh, first one, like uh, usually like what level of Kubernetes, uh, or what level of knowledge in KDS is expected from an SD1? Uh, this actually like varies uh, like usually like the basic concepts like mainly understanding uh, the core concepts of how the microservices work and uh, so that it helps you to uh, build the core microservice how it runs in the kubernetes it's good to have like the knowledge because uh, you know, because uh, the application has to be designed with the self-healing capabilities uh, and then like the retry mechanisms in place. So uh, I, I would say like the Kubernetes 101 uh, concepts is like a good uh, starting point uh, for an SD ones. Now, what is Nginx? Like Nginx is a, a uh, Nginx is a web server. Uh, it, it is like one of like the popularly like known uh, web, web web server uh, that can handle uh, 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 web applications. And uh, which type of service is like best suited for uh, large applications uh, like cluster IP or like load balancer? Uh, so mainly like cluster IP is internal. 
So whenever we create a service of type cluster IP, it is internal to the cluster. Like it is like uh, uh, from outside the cluster, we cannot access uh, a, access the service or a pod using cluster IP. But load balancer allows us to. Uh, but service of type load balancer will uh, allows us to access the application pods from external. It creates the load balancer dynamically. Uh, uh, as needed, like if you are like using a metal LB or uh, AWS load balancer. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions in the chat, but let me uh, get into the demo and then uh, we can uh, go from there. Okay, now, uh, so this is like the sample application uh, that I have, like if you are like, uh, uh, if you looked at the GitHub repository, uh, you will see the similar code structure. So uh, we're gonna look into like just the app section of it and uh, the depth class section uh, for now. So it, this is a, a simple Go application and uh, if, uh, which just like show, which opens up the home page uh, in here. So if I open a quick terminal in here, so I'm going to run this application, and uh, it is a simple web application that uh, that gets launched on port 8080. So let's open this from a web browser. So this is a simple web application uh, that I've launched uh, from the screen. So let's say if I change the color of the application, uh, it's using uh, the home page template, and it's using this green color. Let's say if we, if I just change this to blue, and then run the application again, and it is running on port 8080. Uh, here is like the main program where the application is running on port 8080. So this is like a simple web application which takes reads a couple of environment variables and uh, updates it here. Okay, uh, we are going to uh, like run this, like build an image out of this, and then uh, run it, uh, run it in Kubernetes clusters. So uh, right now, uh, uh, I have this application. So the step one is for me to package this application into a container. So how it can be done is by building a Docker image out of it. So in order to build a Docker image, we need a uh, to have a Docker file. So Docker file, uh, uh, in Docker file, we define the environment, then copy the application code into it. And then we usually like build the application code and define like certain uh, parameters. And uh, we uh, will be uh, doing a deep dive on Docker file, how to build a containerized image. Uh, we have like done a session like last week and the, the recording is available uh, in uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to uh, check them out to get an understanding of how to containerize this application in detail. From this Docker image, I'm going to build this image. So it, it is done using Docker build command. So in the Docker build option that what we are saying is like, set the name as Avina JCD, uh, like this is my Docker Hub repository username. And this is the name of the image. Uh, the full form like will create like the name of the image. So using uh, the current like lo local context, uh, we are building the image. So this runs, uh, this copies the application code into a container and then builds the image, packages it. And once it is packaged, we so right now the image is packaged. So here is the image that is packaged 14 seconds ago. So with this package image, we are going to publish it, publish this image to the Docker Hub where we can pull it from in different clusters because like this image right now is local to my environment. So I'm going to push this image to Docker Hub. And once this image is pushed, then uh, what we can uh, do is run this particular image. So in order to run this application, uh, run this in a Kubernetes image, uh, what I referred to earlier is like we need to create a deployment with the specific, with all the specifications, like with which container it should run, what is its policies, etc. So 
uh, here is uh, uh, the deployment configuration uh, that it is. And what we are saying is it has to run three replicas. That means three instances of uh, the cluster. Uh, sorry, three instances of our application. And we'll be looking at like scaling it up and scaling down. And then we have a template with like the metadata, uh, like the container, uh, and where we have the specification of the container, which says like the blue and green. Now, in order to deploy this, we need to submit this uh, manifest file, uh, like with the, with the YAML file into the Kubernetes cluster. In order to submit this, like we need to interact with the Kubernetes cluster using the UI or using the command line, the kubectl. So uh, here, like uh, I'm going to use uh, the length, which is uh, an UI, which is an IDE for Kubernetes. What we can do is uh, let. So I'm like initially deploying, going to deploy this application in the Kuber, uh, in the Miratus Kubernetes engine, where the like the cluster is deployed on AWS, and I have like it's a three-node cluster, uh, to which that I'm going to deploy this. And uh, using lens gives me ability to like uh, look into the cluster uh, without running complex kubectl commands or we have to like run multiple kubectl commands just to get uh, the node information and then try to, trying to identify uh, like the host address or like more details of like what type of labels uh, that exist on the nodes and what workloads that are deployed in the cluster we need to like run multiple commands to figure out that but it provides like a nice graphical interface so in order to submit this app, uh, application like uh, as we are seeing it so i'm going to like uh, look at the these are like the existing parts in my cluster but what we are going to run but in the example our application name is uh, with, uh, colored canvas so whenever i create, deploy this application it will show up here so i've deployed the application right now so if the deployment is successful, it is going to create three different parts in here because uh, we have set the replica uh, value to three. Now, if you are like saying here, like so it created the application, uh, the, the part with three replicas right now. And we can see this is controlled by a replica set and on which node the pod is running. And uh, uh, like the pod has uh, a unique IP address and then all the, on the on which node it is running. Now, how do we access this pod? This IP address is completely internal to the Kubernetes cluster. And that's where we talked about like a Kubernetes service. So we have to create a service object to access these pods. So for, so here is the specification of a service, like since uh, it is of like type, uh, it is exposed on port 8080. I'm going to create a, a, a service of a type cluster IP, which is like local to the cluster. And we're going to run, deploy this new manifest file. Okay, so now I'm going to navigate to the services section and uh, we I have to look okay the canvas is the name of the service which is created like just few seconds ago and uh, this is the ip address of the service so now i can access and if you look at the endpoints these are like the three ips like 21 like uh, 2.21 uh, 74.159 and 74.161 these are the ip addresses of uh, of our three different parts and let's see what is there in the application. So I can use the port forwarding functionality uh, to access the application directly using the cluster IP. But this is like mainly port forwarding is used mainly for like testing. But when it comes to uh, deploying it in production, we will be creating or using the service types like load balancer or service type, uh, uh, diff different, service, uh, different service types as needed. Now, Let's say, uh, let's do this. We are going to uh, scale our application. Like we are going to, uh, going to scale our deployment uh, from three replicas to like 
and lift the cars. So when we do this, then what happens is immediately the uh, replication uh, replica set will start. Uh, the deployment controller will uh, notify the replication uh, replica set, and then the replication controller will uh, launch. Uh, like make sure uh, the desired state is does not match the actual state, so it creates like more pods. So right now, if you see, like it created like more number of pods, and if we come and look at the our uh, survey service, like the number of endpoints that it has is higher. So whenever, like let's say, if we delete the, some other pods, like the, uh, the the this particular uh, the endpoints will be like less. So the service object will allow us to access uh, the pods seamlessly. Like if the uh, if the IPs are changing rapidly, the service object will continuously keep track of it and then make sure uh, that we have access to these. And uh, I, we can also like change the uh, deployment specification. So like let's say I've used like a default color uh, earlier uh, as blue, but uh, Let's change that uh, to a different color. Maybe I'll just call it um, green and save and close. So what it does is, since there is a deployment configuration that is changed, all the parts will get restarted to match the new configuration or like the new state. So right now it's in the process of terminating and creating new parts. So once it creates new parts, if we uh, we can like go access the service one more time. Once everything is there, like we're just gonna stop the port, port forwarding functionality, and then restart the port forwarding functionality. And it actually like took me to a new window. So it opened up on a new port, and then like as I mentioned, the green. So it showed up green here. So these, uh, so right now we containerize. Uh, just to summarize, like we containerize our application, and uh, and then wrapped it uh, around Kubernetes and uh, executed the container as a pod within the Kubernetes cluster. So this is in MKE. Right now uh, we have the specification in there. We have uh, these two applications. Now our application is running like locally or like on a Kubernetes Kubernetes engine. What if, if you want to like run it in a different environment or like different, uh, like in Amazon, uh, like EKS or AKS or GKE or like lens dev cluster. What we can do is we can uh, go into that cluster and we can try to submit the same configuration file in a different cluster and see how it behaves. So, uh, so this is where uh, the powerful uh, feature of, this is like the key powerful feature of Kubernetes where that, where uh, it is portable, like we can uh, take our application and deploy into any environment, any number of environments, uh, with uh, without uh, major, major, uh, you know, uh, major friction around it. So I'm going to go into the directly uh, directory where I have the application code and deploy uh, and then we built and built the image one so we don't have to rebuild it again all i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, show you the parts section of part section and this one was created uh, before so i'm just going to delete this particular deployment for now and then uh, create it also i'm going to match our specification uh, just to differentiate so here I'm just going to change the description, like the color from the uh, this particular code to green. So it's going to match our uh, other environment. Kubectl apply apply is the way to uh, uh, apply uh, a manifest file into the Kubernetes cluster. Let's say if you have to delete this particular object, like all the objects that are defined in this YAML file. We can run a kubectl delete, and a kubectl uh, is a very powerful tool to interact with the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, like the lens ID, like that uh, uh, I'm showing here, it's uh, it's like a wrapper around the kubectl. Like everything that kubectl does, uh, it, major majority of the functionalities uh, uh, can be done like through within lens.
now we deployed this application now uh, this application has like three replicas now we have to create the service to access our application uh, actually this was created uh, before so i'm gonna uh, actually yeah i'm gonna just showcase with it so the service is created before so there is no specific order like that we have to create parts first and then the service there is no need uh, to do that so i'm going to access this particular um, service and when we click on start it opened up in a new window uh, on this new cluster with a different uh, port number so this is the port number that is used when i forwarded it through the landscape cluster and then this is one with the mirandis kubernetes engine so so here we can see like how consistent uh, the environment our application is across different environments we don't have to worry about setting up the go go uh, go libraries the dependencies for the application like uh, and then uh, copy it in different machines everything like i have we have this uh, kubernetes cluster just with the container runtime and uh, container runtime and then uh, uh, running kubernetes uh, along with it so we have we can port our application to different environments uh, once we have uh, once we packaged it okay with that uh, going back to the slides so we just like looked at like building a docker image uh, like pushing a, like the docker image uh, into a register using docker push command and then uh, the we looked into the kts object of like the deployment and then the kts object with the kubernetes service and uh, so we looked at uh, like tell this part like how the service and then we access the service using the uh, port forwarding uh, mechanism but in reality for every application like there is like a dns and like usually like uh, we define like rules on uh, based on like the traffic let's say if a user is accessing the application from uk region uh, the request should go into the service uh, uh, into XYZ service. If uh, the user is uh, accessing from uh, uh, US region, the request has to go through. So what uh, ingress object does is it provides us, uh, it exposes a service to internet and uh, also helps us to like create rules, rules uh, for the user traffic, like how it needs to be load balanced, et cetera. And uh, so one other concept that uh, is like critical within like a Kubernetes environment, uh, which uh, uh, which abstracts or like it's a logical isolation uh, in the Kubernetes uh, cluster, like everything that we create goes into a specific namespace. So in our demo, what are the objects that we created uh, were a part of the default namespace, but we can logically group all these different pods, applications, all, all these uh, uh, Kubernetes objects into different uh, namespaces. For example, uh, like the cube system is the, uh, contains all the system level, uh, uh, system related uh, objects are within the cube system. So if you just look at like the deployments, we see the core DNS, uh, the controller, uh, the calico cube controllers etc in here so with that uh, okay that is like with one application how does like all these fits in together with multiple applications so this is like the first one is the application a and then like the application one and application two so usually like the we have the deploy.yaml which manages the parts and then we'll be having a service object and then is a an ingress object which is managed through the ingress controller and uh, the application dns will uh, dns will be pointing to the load balancer and the ingress controller will have the rules on which dns should be routed to which particular application if it is app one or app two and the user request will flow accordingly but yeah like so this is like a bit more advanced concept like once uh, we get familiar with like building that base application and accessing with the kube proxy we uh, uh, 
that's like the step one and then this is like the step two like just to see how it all fits in together and we will be having like a deep dive session in uh, on ingress and how to configure ingress objects in the future and with that uh, i can take a few more questions but i think we have uh, uh, we have one more minute left so i will follow up uh, uh, on these questions uh, in uh, in a blog post in a, in a small blog post and also like in the email uh, that email that i'm going to send out so with that yeah thank you so much uh, thank you everyone like for joining and uh, this is what you will be like receiving like as a next step so i'll be like sharing uh, like the recording slides and then like uh, possibly a short survey uh, please take some time to let us know how uh, what do you think about the session so we can improve on and then bring in more useful content uh, content to you and uh, and also what uh, mirantis uh, and how Mirantis can help with uh, the use cases and then the, with, with the challenges uh, that you are all working on. Uh, and like the next Tuesday, we have another session which talks about like, the CI/CD uh, with Kubernetes. So we will we'll be using like, the same uh, colored canvas application, and we'll be right currently we deployed application uh, using. Uh, manual steps but in the next demo we'll be looking at deploying applications application using the ci cd mechanism okay uh, with that uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining uh, me today and uh, hope uh, to see you uh, in the next session thanks everyone